Hello and welcome to our webinar, Picture This. Three illustrators discuss the art behind storytelling. I'm Maggie Reagan, Books for Youth Senior Editor at Booklist. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some technical details. Today's title list was included in the reminder email you received from Zoom one hour ago. To download it, please open that email, scroll to the bottom, and click on the link located there. You can also download it by copying the URL on this screen into your web browser. If you have any trouble, please contact us at webinars at booklistonline.com. The audience is in listen-only mode, but we welcome any questions you may have. On the bottom of your screen is a toolbar with a section for Q&A. If you have a question or need technical assistance, simply click Q&A and type your message into the box that appears. We will do our best to respond to all tech-related questions, and we will pass along all other questions to today's panelists so that they can follow up with you after the webinar. Booklist offers closed captioning on all webinars. To enable or disable captions on your screen, please look for and click the live transcript icon on the toolbar mentioned earlier. From there, you can select show or hide subtitles from the menu that appears. If you choose to enable subtitles, you can adjust the size of the captions at any time by selecting subtitle settings. And finally, Booklist expects all participants to maintain an atmosphere of respect and fairness. Anyone who violates this standard of behavior, including engaging in any form of harassment, may, at the discretion of the organizers, be immediately removed. Today, we have the pleasure of hearing from Andy Harkness, creator of Wolf Boy is Scared, Shadra Strickland, creator of Jump In, and Adrian Teal, co-creator and illustrator of Plague Busters, Medicine's Battles with History's Deadliest Diseases. We will hear a brief presentation from each panelist and then move on to a Q&A about their book. We'll start with Andy Harkness. Andy attended the Columbus College of Art and Design in Ohio from 1991 to 1993 and was hired at Disney Feature Animation in 1994. He began his career as a cleanup animator on Pocahontas and after three years in cleanup, moved into the layout department. In 2004, he was hired as an art director at Sony Picture Animation on Open Season and in 2006 moved back to Disney and worked as an art director and visual development artist on many films. His first children's book, Bug Zoo, was published in 2016, and he currently works as a visual development artist at Sony Pictures Animation. Andy, thank you so much for being here. Good morning. Welcome to my garage here in California. Um, yes, so my book is Wolf Boy is Scared, and it's uh, a bit of an obsessive creative process <laughs> that went into this book. If you have read the first Wolf Boy, uh, the process for creating that book was made out of clay. It was all clay. I, I was on Moana. I built a lot of locations and sets out of clay. I was not proficient in 3D, so clay was just a great media for me, medium for me. And that just rolled over into my children's books, and I began doing that. And halfway through the creation of the second Wolf Boy, of Wolf Boy is Scared, I began messing around with VR, sculpting in virtual reality. And what was incredible about it is uh, right off the bat is how immersive it is. So instead of looking at the screen and painting away, I was inside the illustration. I could make the trees as tall as I was and Wolf Boy as big as I was. And it was, it's just a very immersive process. So today I'm gonna take you through that process and how these illustrations were made. Okay, next slide. So everything starts with a sketch. This for me is the heart of it all. This is me probably on a train crossing the country to see my mom sketching on my iPad, uh, Procreate. And what's valuable in the sketch process is I'm not really thinking so much about anything technical. It's just getting the, the gesture of the character down. And those little nuances and happy accidents and mistakes become very important down the road when I'm sculpting to make sure that nothing feels too mechanical and perfect uh, in, in VR. So this is the first drawing. Okay, next slide. And then I bring that drawing into VR. And 
sculpt away. So very much like clay, uh, starting with a big round clay tool to block in the shapes, very much like I would do with clay here. And again, it's sped, the video is sped up, but I'm trying very, very carefully to keep in, make sure I get all the little nuances from the edge work, everything that gave the drawing its character. Now I'll go back in with the detail work. This is a particular sculpting tool where you can start getting the shapes. If I were doing this in clay, it would be a wood tool I'd be carving with, but in here it's, it's a virtual reality tool. And here is the finished VR sculpt. Okay, next slide. Then that sculpt is, uh, oh, next is to create the texture. So I create the texture with clay, just like I would do normally, fingerprints and everything and then creating a 3D map of that texture that I project onto the, the VR sculpt. And uh, this is a very time consuming process. There's no time saving. <laughs> you can see the fingerprints there on the clay. So it's, it's, uh, that was really important to you to make it feel real, tangible, and then to light it. It's a very simple lighting program. And there's the render. So this would be the equivalent of taking a picture of my clay. And um, okay, next slide. And now I'm just gonna walk through really quickly from the very beginning again. And so this is the original sketch. This is what I would show Mary Kate and everyone at Bloomsbury. You can see there's a note there to the left of the, the moon. That was a, a note for one of the illustrations. Um, half of these illustrations I actually created in clay before I decided to switch. And you can see at the bottom here, that's clay at the bottom. Okay, next slide. And here is the VR sculpt. This one was, um, I think this is a video if you play. This shows all the different levels. This was a very complex sculpture altogether. And it took about three or four weeks to do. The video is sped up, so it makes it look fast, but it's not. And you can move a light around inside VR just to, to test the space of everything. Um, just like if I were holding a clay sculpt in front of a window and moving it around to see how the sun plays on the shapes. That's what, the, this is the equivalent of that. All right, next slide. And so that this is now that sculpt with all of the texture added to it and the clay sculpture. So at this point on, it's exactly like the first book. This now goes into Photoshop and you can go to the next slide where all the final color is applied and just the, the nuancing and the, the vignetting of the shapes and everything. And this is a, an example of a final illustration. So that is kind of in a nutshell, the whole process. Um, that's, I'm like, I could stare at that illustration for probably like another 20 minutes. <laughs> that's really cool. I had no idea all of that went into that. Um, but we're going to dive into some questions now, Andy. Uh, hello. Sorry. That was my face. Uh, to learn a little bit more about your book. Um, so let's start off talking about the colors and the shadowing that you achieve, because those are really amazing. Um, and I think that really immerses readers in the suspense of the story and their own experiences of being afraid. So, um, I mean, the spread that you just showed us was really cool, but do you have a favorite spread? And is there one that was the most difficult to work on? Oh, that's a great question. Um, that was a tough one. Um, oh boy. Probably the hardest spread is, I have the book in here in front of me. <clears throat> it's kind of a top-down view of the forest and you see the horns of the monster um, walking through the forest behind this one right here. Um, I sculpted this one in clay three times first. And then, and then when, I, when I jumped over to VR, um, I must have sculpted this about nine times. There's just a lot of detail in this thing. Um, and it kind of goes on and on and on, the detail in, in the shadows and everything. And as I got into Photoshop, it was kind of an endless process of smoothing and rendering and making sure everything was sitting just right. Uh, but this was just an, a very important one. And Sometimes, sometimes they, they come together quickly, sometimes they don't. But in terms of fear, I grew up, my dad loved horror movies and I loved them as a kid. And I've, I always wanted to make a children's book that was kind of scary, but not really, that had that vibe to it. Um, and I love film noir. So that's uh, the, the reason for the monochromatic palette. But, but Wolf Boy and the rabbits and the monster all have the pop of color on top of that, on top of that. 
Well, it's interesting because in your first Wolf Boy book, um, hunger causes Wolf Boy to become a monster. But in this book, uh, he's he's afraid of a monster. So um, what's what do you hope that this book will encourage things to think about uh, kids to think about, especially, I guess, in terms of their own fear? Gosh, you know, it the, the world is a little scary. I mean, there's stuff going on right now. I've got two young kids and there's a lot of questions that come out of them. And and it's as a parent, it's sometimes it's difficult to know how to answer them. Um, uh, the big thing is just I, I encourage my boys to talk, to get it out and talk with me, talk with me. And that a lot of times that really, really helps. I personally am afraid of flying. So if I'm sitting next to my wife on a plane, I'm telling her the entire flight. Oh, what about this? It just helps me to get through it. Wolf Boy in this book, he's too prideful to admit he's afraid. And, uh, and, and that's kind of the key is that he doesn't want to talk about it. And so I'm hoping when kids read this, they see that and laugh about it a little bit. And it's an entertaining way. Oh, I would have talked about it. Why didn't Wolf Boy? You know, that's, that's the idea behind this book. Um, so when it comes to this virtual animation process that you just spoke, and I mean, you just introduced me to it because this isn't something I have, I'm familiar with. Um, it sounds like it's something that's very time consuming, but that reaps these like really intricate um, rewards. So what is like the biggest uh, advantage, I guess, of using it or the biggest reward of you using it for you? And then what's like the biggest disadvantage? Okay. Uh, the biggest advan the advantage is that the final compositions are very close to what I initially did in my sketch. So with real clay, there are limitations and limitations are beautiful. You know, I, I love limitations um, with art because it kind of forces you to think in a different way. But at the end of the day, on the original Wolf Boy, when I was photographing the clay sculptures with my iPhone from above and trying to hold still, there are always parts of the sculpture that were out of focus or the perspective was slightly off. And it was um, very time consuming to piece all of that together to get it kind of what I thought it would be, but never quite exactly, you know, it was always a little different with, um, and then gravity. So I don't like, I don't want to cook the clay because um, once it's cooked, there's no going back. And if there's any changes, uh, that's a re-sculpt. So I kept the clay wet, um, but over time, all those levels begin to droop. <laughs> and if I have to re-photograph, it just doesn't hold the original shape very well. In VR, there is no gravity, so I can build levels, I can build hundreds of levels, and, and there's no concern of gravity. There's nothing, whatever my brain is thinking up, there's no limitations there in terms of the technical aspect of things. It can, it can hold up. And then um, the lighting is very consistent from, from page to page to page. Whereas in the first Wolf Boy, I had to make sure, okay, at 10 a.m., I'm photographing this with the glass on the patio at the same angle every single time. <laughs> and uh, and so that, um, for me, that was a hindrance. It, it slowed down the process so much, I couldn't just really, really dive into it creatively. Where this process works as fast as where my creativity wants to go with it. And so it's it's takes a lot longer in some ways, but all that extra time is put into the creative process and not the technical prospect process of it. How long did the entire process take you from start to finish? This book took, oh gosh, uh, about a year and a half. For yeah. me, writing is the hardest part. Yeah. That's the part that I'm constantly working harder and harder on. And so that was a big chunk of the time <laughs> to really get that right. Um, and yeah, the some illustrations did take uh, a month. One took uh, almost six weeks to do. Some came together in about three hours, like really, really fast. Wow. Um, but it, it definitely takes some time to do. But I, uh, I, I don't, I can't speak for every single artist, but I think most that I work with say that the creative process is the most fun part. And then when the book is all done, I love it. I hold it and I share it. But but the connection is not quite as strong. It's when the when we're actually creating. So um, that's the part I love the most, just making it. That's really cool. And it's fascinating to look at. So thank you so much, Andy. Um, and we're now moving on to our next panelist, Shadra Strickland. Thank you. 
Shadra studied design, writing, and illustration at Syracuse University and later went on to complete her MFA at the School of Visual Arts in New York City. She won the Ezra Jack Keats Award and the Coretta Scott King slash John Steptoe Award for New Talent in 2009 for her work and her first picture book, Bird, written by Zeta Elliott. Strickland co-illustrated Our Children Can Soar, winner of a 2010 NAACP Image Award. She has published with Lee and Lowe Books, Simon & Schuster, Random House, Candlewick, Chronicle Books, and Little Brown. Her books have received recognition from the American Library Association, Junior Library Guild, and other prominent literary organizations. She is represented by Lori Nowicki at Painted Words. Shadra currently teaches illustration at Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore, Maryland. Take it away, Shadra. Hi, everyone. I always cringe when I when I hear uh, those bios. <laughs> so long. Okay, let's get into it. So, uh, jump in is my first author illustrated project, and I want to talk to everyone about um, just how it came together, starting with the the brain the brain work, the idea of it all. So, I have a fun commercial. So that commercial, I was desperately trying to write uh, stories just out of my head and none of them were working, but I saw that commercial and was immediately inspired and was like, you know, I want to write something as an exercise. So I sat down and wrote uh, the first draft of Jump In. It came together in a few days and um, showed it to my agent. She's like, where have you been hiding this? And we were able to sell this one pretty, pretty quickly. Um, but I felt like I was cheating because all those other stories I worked so hard on. <laughs> but this is the dummy process. And with every book, it starts with a sketch dummy. Um, I tried illustrating this in a typical 32 page format but uh, it just wasn't enough room. And so I was like, let me just play around and try these gatefolds. Uh, fun fact, I designed for Bloomsbury uh, children's books many years ago. And so I was exposed to so many interesting um, formats and gatefolds is one of them. So I made this dummy and I'll fast forward a little bit and sent it to Mary Kate, my editor and Donna Mark, the art director. Um, hoping that they'd say yes. <laughs> I knew I couldn't say, hey, can I get like, you know, five gatefolds in a book? Because the answer would be no, absolutely not. But this uh, convinced them. So even when I'm teaching now, I tell my students the, the key rule in picture books is always show, don't tell. So they said yes. And then we're on to final art. When I'm illustrating, I have to let a lot of information in. Um, I had some idea of what I wanted jump in to look like, but I also uh, sourced a lot of other pop references. So I looked at the original intro to uh, West Side Story, um, struck by the, the playground, the city, um, and then the really cool um, establishing shots for that film. And I was able to kind of bring that into uh, the introduction to jump in. So when we first opened the book, we do see a quiet neighborhood. And then when we get to the action, it's super low on the ground. Um, so we can really get a sense of the ropes and the rhythm. I'm also, I'm, I'm looking at everybody. I need all the help that I can get when I'm illustrating. So in this case, I uh, look at Italian futurists because of their dynamic perspectives, uh, their sense of motion and movement. And this is Tulio Crawley before the parachute opens. I just love this point of view. Um, and again, sort of the ghosting of the arms, I wanted to bring that in to jump in to show movement of limbs and the movement of the ropes. Uh, this book was done in Procreate, it's done digitally. 
uh, it was my first time working this way, but I knew that traditional media, which is how I usually work, wasn't going to allow me a lot of the flexibility um, that digital work would. This is Fortunato de Pero, another Italian futurist. Um, this is skyscrapers and tunnels. And I love those suns and all the buildings kind of falling into each other. And I knew like the main character of Jump In was, was movement and motion, right? It's an ensemble cast, but it's definitely about the movement. And so you can see a direct reference from that painting to what I'm doing here with one of the main characters leaping out, stretching his limbs all the way out, and then those buildings kind of falling away uh, dynamically on the page. Uh, I'm looking at fine art. I love this image of um, this auntie <laughs> double dutchy and thought, wow, she should totally be in this book. Fun fact, I'm an only child. So I didn't do a lot of double dutching growing up. I always wanted to. I didn't learn how to double dutch before the book came out because I didn't want to be a fraud. But um, this is sort of a, a wild dream of what I would have loved to have been able to do as a kid. Um, this process with the artwork was extremely collaborative. Um, the idea of the gatefolds needed to be passed back and forth between myself and my um, art director. And so this is one of those conversations. Okay. So this one, he's supposed to be here, right? So jump in and then you start this text. I bring it up with a bottom neck. And then we open it to reveal the whole string. What I want to do to is pick up art from this side. I'll move her over, clear that shoe, and then continue the fourth ear. Um, so that would be the viewer's page. Okay. So it again was from start to finish a lot of conversation about um, how the pages would work, how the folds would work from, you know, like I said, beginning to end. And so this is once all the artwork was done, which took me about a year and a half, I think, to finish the artwork. Uh, this was the, the dummy that we got back from China showing us how all the gatefolds work. This video is the same that takes sequence of all the gatefolds. So page one is one, two, three, four, five, there's that sun again. <laughs> I'll stop it there. And lastly, I'll just talk about my dog who lives in my studio with me and found his way into the book. And thank you very much. That's a little bit of behind the scenes of the thought process of Jump In. <laughs> Shada, thank you so much. That was really interesting to look at. I am always so impressed by how people like incorporate movement into illustrations because it like just blows my mind because it's such a like still medium to me and the way you use the gatefolds here is um it just is really magical the way you have them moving through those so that's just it's really cool to see how your process works um this is your first book as both an author and an illustrator uh how was your process for this book different from when you were only illustrating as the full creator uh, there's a lot more pressure. You know, I knew that it all rested on me. I, I can't blame it on bad writing, which I never do. I've worked with some incredible writers, but um, there's just a lot of pressure. You know, I knew I wanted this book to stand out and to really um, uh, kind of bring me my, my debut. It felt like a debutante being introduced to the world as an author. So just a lot more pressure. <laughs> 
Um, you mentioned this in your author's note, and then you you spoke a lot about it in your presentation and showed us some spreads. But um, your book was influenced by Italian futurists. Um, that's I know that's not something I know very much about, which I'm sure is probably true for people in the audience too. Can you explain a little bit more about uh, what that means and who they are, and um, any additional artistic choices you made based on that? Sure. So unfortunately, Italian futurists were, they weren't the nicest people. Like their <laughs> philosophies were up with machines, down with women and war, war, war. So they were just a loud like group of mostly men. Um, but they were fascinated with industry, with machines, with movement, um, with the camera. Uh, and so all of their artwork really incorporates all of these wonderful um, sort of echoes of, of, of figures walking around and moving throughout space. And I just, and the way that they kind of divided the page, similar to cubism, um, but just prettier, I think. I, I'm not a fan of Picasso and the cubist. Sorry to all of you Picasso fans, but um, I just felt like their work really nailed what I was trying to do and bring uh, into Jump In. Awesome. Um, and I know we asked Andy this, but I just like picking a favorite kid, but do you have a favorite spread in the book? Yeah, I think um, this one is not in the presentation, but oh, it's wow. the scene where all of the, the cast and community are on the playground jumping. And it's my favorite, but when I was doing it, I hated it. and was like, who put all these people in this book? And I'm like, oh, it was you. It was you, you did that. So, but I love, I love the, the, the zoom out, that street light comes yeah. on. The perspective on that's so cool. The color usage is really cool throughout the whole book. I mean, I love the yellows, but the pink in that spread is gorgeous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Summertime. <laughs> <laughs> Finally. Um, and then I know you talked about your inspiration for the book uh, from the commercial, but what, I mean, can you speak broadly to what made you want to write a picture book that celebrates um, like neighborhoods and community and just fun? Sure, I grew up in Georgia in neighborhoods and community and fun. Again, only child. So I was the kid at the beginning of the book who runs out and is like, somebody come and play with me. But I was always outside, always in fresh air and sunshine. And so initially when I wrote this book, I thought, oh man, this isn't, this doesn't really reflect me. This was just an exercise. But now I'm like, oh, this is exactly who you are, Shadra. Like, this is you wanting everybody to come play and, you know, just be together and learn from each other and have a good time. So it definitely does reflect kind of how I live my life. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. That is our time. But Shadra, thank you so much for sharing this sure. with us and for chatting with us today. Our final presenter will be Adrian Teal. Adrian is an internationally renowned caricaturist, cartoonist, illustrator, and writer. He is currently designing caricature puppets for the return of the hugely popular hit 1980s, 1990s satirical TV show, Spitting Image. He was also head of 3D celebrity caricature design on the award-winning ITV show, Big Heads. He has been a caricature consultant for Framestore and BBC Two, and he has produced a cover and written slash illustrated historical spreads for the BBC's QI books. He has illustrated for QI merchandise and marketing material, as well as for the TV show itself. His freelance illustration clients have included the band Madness, Mercedes-Benz, UBS, the comedy club Jonglers, and Anglia TV. He has produced illustrations and political cartoons for national and international publications, such as the Sunday Telegraph, Penthouse, The Scotsman, The Times, The Guardian, Time Out, The Sun, and The Daily Mail. Thank you so much for joining us today, Adrian. Hello, thank you very much indeed. Well, it's lovely to be here. Um, I'm actually in my wife's office today. Um, uh, my wife is also the, my co-author on the book. Um, you might be able to tell from this office, she's a, um, a medical historian, which is why we've got all these kind of weird samples and stuff in the background here, um, specimens rather. Um, but the thing about Lindsay is she has an Oxford PhD but she also has an enormous sense of fun. So we work very closely together. We work very well together on, on creative projects and we were looking for something that we could work on together. And so the, a children's book seemed to be the obvious, the obvious choice really, because we both love delivering um, history in fun and engaging ways to people, not in a, in, a dry, in a dry way as it sometimes can be. So when we got the, the, the book deal for Plague Busters, I, immediately started looking for those kind of inspirations that that influenced me when I was a kid 
um, arguing or reasoning rather that that if it appealed to me when I was a, a child, it would very likely appeal to kids today. So um, I was thinking back to things like um, Terry Gilliam, who was the, obviously the Monty Python um, animator and, and illustrator. Um, and anything like that really was appealing to me for this book as a, as a source of inspiration, because I feel that um, anything that gives you, anything that gives kids especially a kind of a skewed way of looking at the world, a sort of slightly left field way of looking at the world was gonna be very, very useful. Um, and uh, I, I think that there can be among kids, there can be a little bit of resistance sometimes to history because I think kids can probably find it a little bit dry now and again. But so anything humorous, anything that involves illustration, I think is a really good way of, of getting kids into history. So what I thought I'd do is talk very briefly about three of the aspects of illustrating Plague Busters that, that, uh, that, that, that seem to me to be the most important. Um, the first is really the importance to me of, of photo references and, and historical accuracy and getting things right. Um, I like to get the visuals accurate. My process involves absorbing, like, like you know, Andy and, and Shadow have mentioned, getting as much visual information as you can into your brain about the period or periods in this case that you're talking about. Um, so I do sort of collect a lot of references, visual references before I start any drawing at all. Um, there's a there's an example in the book which I haven't got on a slide, but there's there is one illustration in the book which is of the um, the Five Points slum, uh, which was an area of New York in the in the 19th century, um, and I wanted to make sure that I got that as as accurately as I could as an illustration. So I studied the, the sort of contemporary illustrations of the Five Points slum and and then sort of superimposed some cartoon characters on the on the top of that. Um, so that's my approach. So if I could have my, my first slide, please. Um, this is also another uh, example of the importance to me of visual references. So I couldn't find anywhere um, a suitable um, uh, photograph or reference photograph of a, of a plague doctor. So I actually had to get Lindsay to dress up uh, as a plague doctor and photographer and lighter from the right angle to get it exactly as I wanted it. What you should know, this is a fun fact, what you should know about this uh, photograph is it was taken about three or four days after Lindsay was diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, we, we had quite a tough time in the last last year or so with Lindsay undergoing treatment, but um, this was a kind of our way really of kind of dealing with that news and trying to forget about it for an hour or two. So Lindsay went above and beyond the call of duty really and getting dressed up like this for me so that we could take this photograph. And you'll see my my initial sketch there in the middle. Um, and then on the right is sort of the, the final product. So uh, I owe Lindsay one for that. That was very, very good of her to do that. Um, the book cover was actually inspired somewhat by uh, one of my favourite artists who, whose work I guarantee you will know, but you won't necessarily know his name. So his name is Drew Struzan, and he illustrated or, or um, put together basically every movie poster that Spielberg or George Lucas or any of the Back to the Future films ever did. So you will certainly know his work. Um, he's an absolutely extraordinary talent, but there's one really great, poster that he did that I don't actually think was used. He did it for Guillermo del Toro for his um, second Hellboy movie. And it's the main character Hellboy kind of dwarfed by these huge monsters. And that I found a really compelling image. So when I came up with the idea for the book cover there, um, I wanted a similar feel where you've got this sort of plague doctor who's surrounded by these huge scary monsters. So that was the inspiration, um, the inspiration for that book cover. Um, the second aspect of what I what I did for this book that I wanted to talk about was what I call reacting off text. So usually if I'm illustrating something for an article, a newspaper article or something like that, you're reacting to somebody else's text, which is fine. And that's great. And their text can inspire you. And that can be great. But when you're actually co-writing something, because I, I co-wrote this book, you have the luxury of being able to to change the text to suit an illustration. So if I could have my second slide up, please. This is an example of that. So there was a passage in the, in the chapter about tuberculosis and I, um, I had this idea, that the, the, the basic story was that the King of England 
everybody believed that he had some kind of supernatural power and that if you were touched by the king, then it would cure your tuberculosis, basically. So I had this idea of this kind of octopus, um, touching this regal octopus sort of touching everybody. Um, but that wasn't in the first draft. So we actually changed the first draft to make sure that, that, uh, that, that we could get this illustration in. Now, obviously, all the, all the other um, illustrators here, they don't necessarily have that problem if they're, if they're you know, writing. But to me, that was a real luxury because I don't get that opportunity in my day job. So that was nice to be able to do. Um, the third aspect that I wanted to talk about is caricature, because caricature is my first love. And I consider myself a caricaturist above all other things. So any chance that I get to shoehorn caricature into something, I'm going to take that chance. Um, we have some very familiar faces in the book from the past. Um, if I could have my third slide up, please. Um, who will be familiar to young readers. So one of those is Edgar Allan Poe. So he's in the book because um, he actually appears in our rabies chapter because there is a school of thought that says that he didn't necessarily die of alcoholism. He might've actually died of, of rabies. Um, and if I can have the fourth slide, this is Benjamin Franklin, who's uh, who turns up in our chapter about smallpox. And here you can see him writing a, a sad letter to somebody about the loss of his son. So we have some familiar faces, but other faces from the past, certain, say, medieval kings and people like that, their faces aren't really going to be familiar, not just to kids, but to anybody, really. So to me, caricature is a really great way of injecting some some character and some personality into people that that you haven't ne you're not necessarily very familiar with certainly not visually um and it, it i think makes a lot more impact than just having a sort of dry me reproducing a dry portrait from you know the 19th century of someone that that wouldn't necessarily excite anybody but if you can get some character character in with caricature then you know that that i think is really going to help things move along so Really, those are the three aspects I wanted to talk about. In, in conclusion, really, I, I just wanted to say that it's a real privilege, I think, um, to be able to reach young minds and, and hopefully spark their imaginations. I'm not technically a historian, but I do feel that that imagination is a really underrated way of, of a, a really underrated vehicle for getting people into history. Um, and so if I've in any way helped, you know, with this book, if, if it helps kids find their way into history in any sense, then I, I feel like I've done my job. So there we go. Oh, yeah, this is a this is a, just an example of a of a spread from the book. So you've got uh, this is from the plague chapter. So as you, again, you'll see we've got caricature in here. So uh, that's, you know, like I said, any time I can shoehorn caricature in, I'm going to do it. Thank you, Adrian. Um, I think we're going to dive a little bit deeper into your book with some questions. I'm definitely interested to hit up some of those character elements uh, because the book covers so many topics um, that are like, I think, considered serious topics like the diseases. Yeah. Um, and then it also weaves in stories about how diseases interact with other parts of human history, including things like wars, the Wild West, architecture, art. Um, and then he, I think I mean, you really do a lot of heavy lifting here because you're also calling out contributions by women and people of color uh, who are also getting left out of historical highlights. Um, so these are all a lot of like real heavy, serious things. So how did you and Lindsay decide like when and where to use um, like the more humorous illustrations to help tell these stories? Well, with regard to the serious stuff, I mean, I've always been of the opinion that there isn't really anything that you can't joke about as long as you do it. <laughs> in the right way, right? Um, and in fact, I think sometimes the more serious the subject, the bigger the laugh can be. Um, and sometimes you aren't necessarily joking about the subject or the event itself, but you, you're probably joking about somebody's imagined reaction to it. So for instance, there's a passage in the book on, uh, sorry, a passage in the chapter on tuberculosis. Uh, where we talk about fashionably minded people in the 19th century who who thought that tuberculosis was cool because 
because a lot of writers and artists had it, right? It's the, t it's the typical thing of the artists starving in a garret, you know, and all looking thin and sort of, you know, pale and interesting. And so a lot of fashionable people in the, in the 19th century, they wanted to look the same way. So they actually used to wear makeup to make themselves look ill, which is, you know, kind of weird, but nevertheless, that's what they did. Um, and so the cartoon that I did to accompany this was of a, of a grave with a, with a tombstone and a hand sort of poking out of the grave with a with a uh, a cell phone on a selfie stick taking a photograph of themselves. So the point we're making there really is that the kind of sort of the self obsession, for want of a better phrase, that you see in things like TikTok, it's nothing new. You know, this has been going on for centuries, and hopefully, at the same time, we're eliciting a, a laugh about that at the same time. That's so you know, you can you can make jokes about serious serious matters. I think. Well, in the acknowledgments of the book, you mentioned that you started writing this right as the world was shutting down for COVID. Um, and then this book is aimed at kids who will have spent a huge chunk of their lives living during lockdown. So yeah. what, if anything, about the pandemic experience contributed to the way you chose to illustrate this book or the way you're thinking about it now? Um, I think it probably I think it probably had more of an effect on the text than it did than it did on the on the illustrations. Um, we didn't have to explain too much about pandemics to kids because now, of course, everybody is, you know, perfectly clear on what a pandemic is. Um, I think the COVID experience help will help kids relate to the past more easily because we talk about historic things like you know quarantine and vaccines, the development of vaccines, and so on. Um, and there's one, for, for instance, there's one cartoon right at the end of the book where I show a, a 17th century plague doctor, you know, the beat plague doctor, next to a, a modern healthcare worker in a hazmat suit. Um, so uh, you can do that kind of thing because there's a lot of, you know, cultural and scientific literacy now amongst kids and everybody else um, around these kind of medical measures. So um, I think it, it, it had some bearing on the illustrations it certainly had a bearing on the cover because um as you remember from that cover hopefully um there was a a, a, a spiky um virus you know the coronavirus the, the actual virus itself with the spikes coming off it um I, i'm not sure we necessarily would have put that on a on a children's book cover before the pandemic because i don't know that all kids would have understood what that was but now of course you know it's all over cnn and whatever so everybody now knows what that is so that's that wasn't really a worry so it did it did have some effect yeah definitely and then any favorite part of the book for you any part that sticks out um I one of my favorite illustrations I don't know if it's necessarily the best illustration in the book but my favorite illustration there's a caricature we did of the uh the president Andrew Jackson literally armed to the teeth because there was he was a notorious um fighter of duels and and he fought in the uh, american um, war of independence and uh he's literally got you know cutlasses hanging out of his mouth and he's got um cross belts on his on his chest with musket you know small pistols and he's holding a cutlass and he's holding a gun and it's just and he's got that kind of wild look in his eyes and there's just something about it yeah i think he's is he on your is he on your 20 dollar bill andrew jackson i think he's on the 20 dollar bill i should it? know that he's on the 20 or the 10 i forget which well, but he's got i love him because he's got this sort of wild hair you know and he is slightly mad eyes and he just looks like such a, an interesting character so i really enjoyed really enjoyed drawing him awesome well I think that's all the time we have, Adrian, but thank you so much for being here and a huge thank you to all of today's presenters. Tomorrow, all attendees will receive an email containing links to today's video recording, title list, a certificate of completion, plus additional resources about today's books from our friends at Bloomsbury. For more about Booklist webinars, be sure to visit www.booklistonline.com slash webinars, where you can view archives of past webinars and register for upcoming ones like those you see here. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar, and one final thank you to our sponsor, Bloomsbury Publishing. This concludes today's webinar. We'll see you next time. <laughs>